we've been working for pre on prion diseases for 20 plus years and we've always assumed and said that the work that we're doing is going to help contribute to uh, treatments and cures. But, late, but, but uh, most recently, in, in the project that I'm going to talk to you about, we actually, I think, have an opportunity to really develop uh, compounds that may, or drugs that may contribute to, to uh, a cure or treatment. And so that's been uh, very exciting and, and very satisfying. So that's the project I'd like to tell you about. Okay, so to, to start the project, we wanted to think at a basic level, what are the mechanisms that cause a prion disease? And we thought that there are really two, two kinds of processes or mechanisms that, that play a role. And the first one is shown here, and that is the process you've heard described before, which is the, the process by which the PRPC, which is the normal cellular form of the prion protein, gets converted into uh, PRPSC, the infectious and, and, uh, form of the prion protein. And so it's, it's you know, pretty commonsensical that if you could, uh, uh, it, it's commonsensical that, that one way you could um, uh, treat a prion disease is to find some way to block that conversion. Um, and that's been a, a commonsensical approach that's been pursued by, by many people. Um, and it is a very reasonable approach. But we also wanted to, we also recognize that there's a second kind of process that really contributes to the disease, uh, and that is shown here. Um, and that has to do with uh, what the things that go on after that conversion process occurs, there's something, some, something that happens where that, that abnormal protein does something bad to a nerve cell. It causes the nerve cell to die, or more specifically, what it does is it damages the ability of the, ner of, the, of the nerve cell to communicate with other nerve cells via connections known as synapses. So it causes toxicity to synapses and degeneration of synapses. And that's kind of the essence. After the abnormal proteins full, uh, 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 accumulates, that's the essence of really what causes the symptoms, is degeneration of synapses in the brain. And that's just uh, a little schematic of what a synapse looks like. It's uh, one neuron coming very close to another neuron, but not quite touching it, and there are chemical neurotransmitters which go, back, which go back and forth across that gap, and that's the essence of how your brain works, really. And so we thought another, uh, a second approach to treating prion diseases would be to block that, that, per that process. Okay, so that's the second. The second idea, which is a more novel approach, is to block that, that process that causes synaptic toxicity. And so I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, ways we've been targeting both those to produce a kind of two-pronged strategy. And that, that makes common sense in, in many sorts of diseases. If you can hit two processes at the same time, that might be a more effective therapy. Like when you go to a, a, the drugstore and you buy a combination therapy, it hits two different ways of uh, of, uh, of stopping the disease. Okay, and, that, and actually, uh, another advantage of this kind of approach is that it might allow us to even, to halt or even reverse ongoing neuronal damage. So even though the abnormal protein could still be accumulating, if we can block that process of synaptic toxicity, even once the protein's already started to accumulate, we might be able to halt the damage or potentially even reverse the damage. So that has a lot of appeal also. Okay, so the first step in, in trying to find compounds which inhibit that conversion process was to do what's ca commonly called a drug screen. So pharmaceutical companies do this kind of thing all the time. What you do is you have a big collection of, of uh, organic molecules of potential drugs, and you test them in a kind of cell cellular assay to figure out which ones are going to be most effective. I mean, you obviously can't test each drug in a human patient. You have to have some kind of simpler system to test the drugs. Um, and we, we, we used a particular cell-based system, so cells in the dish, to screen a large a library of, or, of organic compounds. And in this case, rather than directly testing whether they will affect the, the PRPC to PRPC conversion process, we had another kind of assay, which we thought we were 
it was very clever and my, it was different from what other people had used. I, I won't go into it, but it, it did allow us to identify some new molecules that prevent the conversion process. So this is the details of this don't matter. It just shows you that we tested a, a library of about 20,000 compounds using this kind of assay. And what we came up with was uh, one particular active compound which inhibits the accumulation of PRP scrapey, the abnormal isoform, in cells. And that's a, whoops. Oh, now I just turned it off. There we go. Um, <laughs> It's hard to do this. We're used, to, as a professor, we're used to using a pointer to point to things. Uh, so one of the molecules we came up with in this screen is, is diagram there. That's the structure of the molecule. And we found it was uh, very effective in reducing the amount of PRP scrapey in, these, uh, in this cultured cell system. And it was relatively non-toxic to the cells. That's also something you have to worry about if it cures the cell. but but by killing the cell, that's not really a very good drug to use. Uh, so we found a particular, uh, that's an example of what our, what one of our compounds, we call that the lead, they call, in, in drug discovery, that's the lead compound. That's the compound you first discover that looks like it's the most promising and you, then you pursue that. Um, and then what happens is you try and improve the compound, okay? And you can improve it. We uh, collaborated with an organic medicinal chemist at Boston University, and we changed, he changed different parts of the molecule. He identified which parts of the molecule were really essential for its biological activity. Uh, and we came up with uh, improved molecules. One example is this molecule called JZ107. Um, and that had, was effective at a lower dose and was less toxic. And so that's the kind of the, that's the process of any kind of drug discovery project. So uh, that's what we did. And so we're in the midst of pursuing this arm of the, of the thera therapy. Um, we want to, uh, one thing we want to do is identify what is the target of the drug. This is also something that every drug company is always interested in. The drug must be acting by binding to some molecule in, a, in the body, and that's how it produces its effect. And so we don't know what the target is of this particular group of compounds we've identified, but we want, to we, want, we want to find what the target is because then we could potentially build a better molecule that binds to that target or um, what's even more exciting, oops. What's even more exciting is the idea that maybe that target's been identified in another context by other scientists, and maybe they've, they've already identified other drugs which can bind to that same target, and maybe some of those other drugs have actually already been used in human beings, and that would be the ideal kind of scenario. So we're, we're pursuing that. Um, and then, you know, we take these, these, new, these new drugs that we are piggybacking on, and we test them for their um, I, uh, ability to block prion replication. So, so just to summarize, we now have what we think are some promising molecules that block that step one process. Uh, all right, so now um, here are the two strategies again. And now, I guess, uh, and now let's talk about blocking that second step. Okay, so that second step is much less studied and much less understood. Um, and part of the reason is that there hasn't been a really a good system where you could study the effect of prions on those synapse structures that I talked about. Um, and so we had to uh, develop our own system for doing this, and that system, uh, is, it's a system of using growing neurons in a dish, and that kind of system has many advantages because we can analyze the cellular mechanisms. In, in this context, we can assay, uh, uh, we, we, we can study toxic a, a toxic species of the protein, and in this context, test therapeutic compounds. Uh, and so this is just a little diagram of the system that we, we use. We grow neurons on a cover slip that is in a, a, a glass cover slip, inverted over a slide on which another kind of cell called astrocytes are grown. They are kind of support cells for neurons, and they give off nutrients to keep the neurons alive. And then this shows a picture here below it of what this looks like. You can see all the long processes, which are the axons and dendrites of the 
neurons, and the little green dots are the positions of synapses. So those are the places where nerve cells actually connect with each other. That's where all the action's going on in the nervous system. We are particularly interested in structures on synapses or that are part of synapses called dendritic spines. Dendritic spines are actually the little part of the, neuro, of, 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 the of, neuro, of the postsynaptic neuron that contacts the presynaptic neuron. And spines are of enormous importance and an enormous amount of research going on on dendritic spines because that's where learning and memory actually happens. When you learn things, there are changes in the shapes of the dendritic spines at synapses. And, and degeneration of dendritic spines is also thought to contribute to neurodegenerative disease. And so we've been particularly focusing on dendritic spines. It's already known that dendritic spines uh, are important in both prion diseases as well as in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it's known that those spines retract and, and, and degenerate in both prion diseases and um, Alzheimer's disease. So those were the things that, that was gonna be our readout for, for uh, any kind of toxicity of the prions. And we developed a, a system to that, that demonstrated that. Basically what we showed is when you put prions on these specially cultured nerve cells, the dendritic spines very rapidly, they normally stick out from the, from the dendrite, they collapse, they completely collapse, and that makes them non-functional. They can't carry out synaptic transmission. Okay, so he, this was a good kind of assay because now we had a direct cellular correlate of what may be going on in the brain of a patient with a prion disease. And what we were able to do now, with, we took advantage of the system to try and define what are the cellular mechanisms that cause the spine to retract in response to putting on the prion. Um, there are lots of me uh, mechanisms that go on in cells. These are that are called typically signal transduction mechanisms. What that means is that something happens on the outside of the cell and it triggers a whole series of chemical reactions inside the cell. That's called a signal transduction mechanism. And, and we were able to define what we think is at least one important signal transduction mechanism that, that gets activated when a prion binds to the outside of the nerve cell that ultimately leads to collapse of the spine and de defective operation of the, of the synapse. And what's been, what was really interesting is there was one particular protein in this molecular cascade that really caught our eye, and that was a, a protein called P38-MAP kinase. The, the name is not important. The point is it's an enzyme. Uh, it's an enzyme that adds phosphate groups to another protein. And that P38-MAP kinase has been, has been studied by many other people. It is involved in many other kinds of of processes involve, often involving uh, disease-related processes. And so we knew that that P38-MAP kinase had been uh, uh, involved in uh, efforts to treat other diseases. So this is the kind of an inroad we were really looking for. And so we, the first thing we did was we took, there were well-known inhibitors of P38-MAP kinase, and we tried some of those in this synapse assay. And lo and behold, they completely blocked the, the effect of prions causing the synapses to degenerate. When we added that dr those drugs, it blocked that loss of, of synaptic connection. Um, and it could even reverse the synaptic connection if we added it later um, and, and would make the spine actually go back, grow back again. So that was very, that was very promising. And it rescued the the um, physiological defects in, the, in synaptic transmission. And so now that leads to the plan. We're in the middle of this. This is the, this is the CJD Foundation funded project. We're, we're in the middle of it. And our plan is at fo as, as follows, that we're gonna combine two kinds of drugs. One is one, one of those drugs that inhibits uh, PRP scrapie prop propagation. Um, and then the second is one of these P38 MAP kinase inhibitor. And we're gonna specifically select drugs that have that, that are been used for other diseases, other human diseases that we know have, because that means those drugs will have been tested in human beings. We know their pharmacokinetics, how they're taken up by the body. We know something about their safety. And so it would make, if these drugs worked in mice, it would, they could be very easily translated into, into human uh, 
uh, usage. Um, and they were going to feed these drugs to mice initially with, an, with a, a, an infectious prion disease. It could also be tested in mice that have genetic forms of prion disease. And they were going to assess the clinical state of the mice, their neuropathology, and their biochemistry. Um, and the, uh, the overall idea is to ask, does, does this drug combination slow or prevent prion disease in mice? And if so, maybe it is a therapy that could be moved rapidly to humans. And as I say, we're just in the middle of this, and there are lots of times when things that work in mice don't work in humans, so there are many cautions, and we're at the initial stages, but we're very excited about this. So in summary, um, uh, we have identified a new class of compounds that inhibit the accumulation of prions in cells and have identified improved versions of these compounds. We have worked out a cellular pathway that's responsible for the synaptotoxic effect of prions and identified compounds that block specific steps in this pathway. Um, we are now clinic uh, testing clinically relevant examples of these two categories of compounds in mouse models of prion disease. And we hope that our studies will re result in a highly synergistic combination therapy that may, may be directly translatable uh, into humans. And I, I, I want to really uh, thank the uh, uh, families that have contributed to this particular project. I would love to be able to meet members of, of those families if, if they're here. Um, it, it's really, uh, as I said, a very special connection to know the people who are funding, uh, funding our research. And I should also just mention um, several of the members of my own lab who've contributed uh, to this, two former postdocs, Thibaut Imberdis and Cheng Fang, and then my current postdocs, um, Nyat Lee, um, uh, Bei Wu, Ladon Amin, and Robert Mercer, um, who basically the whole lab has kind of gotten involved in this, uh, in this project. So thank you. Thank you.